So, now John. Welcome. Okay. We okay. had breakfast with John this morning. Yes, yeah, we did. Yeah. I'm all ready to go. All right. Um, can, if, if, if I'm speaking, can the people in the back hear me without the microphone, or should I use the mic? Yeah, okay. You can hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, because I'll, I'll talk loud. Go start, just make a little activity in case you'd like me to speak louder, because I like to move around and talk a lot. So uh, that, that's why I'm, I don't like restricted by the mic. Okay, so I, what I'm going to talk about is kind of, you know, we, were, we sequenced this, the, these two talks. So I, I'm going to talk about trauma and how the trauma on the brain affects the function and event, the, stru the structure and eventually the function of the brain and its effect on the post-concussion symptoms and behavior. These are all my views. These are artificial military army views. Okay, this is a program that we developed at Fort Gordon at the Eisenhower Army Medical Center. I have no, uh, nothing, no affiliations to this slurs. <laughs> And the objectives today are to discuss general neurobolic, neurometabolic and structural axonal injuries and mild TBI. So I'm going to be talking about TBI, traumatic brain injury, but I'm going to focus on mild TBI, also <coughs> known as concussion, and understand how the trauma impacts the effect of that concussion. And I'll talk about right now, you know, if, if as a civilian you're riding your bicycle in a park and you fall down and get hit in the head and get a concussion, the expected recovery from that is anywhere from 48 hours to a few months at the most. What are the symptoms after a concussion? Like, like the general mentioned, headaches, memory problems, sleep issues, and mood issues. And we expect that those concussion symptoms will resolve in a civilian concussion, concussion, that's what the data shows, in anywhere from 48 hours to a few months. But let's compare that to a concussion that a soldier experiences in an IED blast, where he was sitting in a vehicle, maybe his buddy burned to death, or he's pulled a, a, a pulled a trigger on a weapon and shot somebody's head off, and that person exploded because of their because of weapons they were carrying. And, and just the trauma of war is a whole different concussion. Okay? And what happens in the experience of that concussion is it has an impact on how long that concussion symptoms last. Very, very significant impact. As a result of that, the behavior is affected by these trauma experiences because the change in the structures of the brain that occurred when the trauma occurred have an impact on now how that person behaves. And the group will leave with a clear understanding of stimulating, depressing other neuro, some neural pathways as a treatment paradigm rather than using pharmaceutical products. And we'll talk about that at, at length. Okay? So brain function can be altered by trauma. So we're, we're talking about two different things here that get all tangled up in a big ball of spaghetti. Okay? If they get all tangled up, you can't, it's difficult, if, if not impossible, I'll say impossible, to really differentiate them. Because when you have a concussion and it's damaged to the neurometabolic and axonal mechanisms in the brain, it results in symptoms of headaches, memory, sleep, and mood issues. But now let's take that concussion being experienced in a combat mission, okay? What does it cause? Well, it causes a dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system, okay? It causes a di autonomic dysregulation. It's a traumatic experience. Primitive reflexive survival instincts get triggered, and patients go into a hyper alertness state, causing stress. What does stress cause? Sleep problems, headaches, mood irritability, and memory problems. The same as concussion. Okay, so you have this perpetuation, the propagation of these concussion symptoms, maybe even after the concussion's healed, but it's promoted and kept alive by this autonomic dysregulation that occurs as a normal reaction. Post-traumatic stress is not a disorder. It's a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. The brain is supposed to react to trauma. It's, it's called the survival instinct. It's the amygdala. Okay, it prepares us for fight or fight in traumatic situations. So let's talk about a little bit about concussion first, neurometabolic axonal injury. Okay, so there's an injury that occurs in the brain during a concussion. It's basically triggered by a neurotransmitter called glutamate. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. It causes, it hits an NMD receptor, and it causes disruption in the, electron, in the electrolyte gradient in the cell. It disrupts the concentration of sodium and potassium. Potassium normally contained in the cell starts to leave. Sodium starts to go in. Okay, it causes another set of metabolic reactions. And basically, the concentrations, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to get too biological here. We could talk about this for hours, okay? And it's really cool stuff. But the, the, 
the gradient of the electrolytes. You know, when you go to the doctor, you get your sodium, you know, your levels measured in your normal electrolyte studies, right? And your serum, your blood levels are within certain numbers. Guess the potassium is being contained inside the cell, concentration-wise, and the so sodium outside the cell. Well, that gets disrupted. And the cell wants to restore that because the cell can't operate metabolically internally in the cell with this abnormal concentration of electrolytes. So what it does is it energizes it, it gets activated, the sodium potassium pump, which runs on a molecule called ATP. Okay? ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is the fuel that runs the sodium potassium pump. But now when this disruption has occurred in the cell, what ends up happening is there's not enough glucose. You go into hyperglycolysis, hyperutilization of glucose, which is utilized to produce the ATP, and the cell goes into an energy crisis state because it doesn't have enough intracellular content of the glucose to repair the, electron, the electrolyte uh, inequality in and out of the cell. And so that's when the uh, concussion symptoms get sustained, OK? I'm new to the cocoon family, OK? Uh, this is a, a, a place where I see possibly cocoon being beneficial if we can raise intracellular levels of oxygen by pretreatment, prophylactic treatment with cocoon. If we can have a lot of oxygen in here, how might that positively affect this energy crisis? We look at it now as a hyperglycolysis, but if, if we get enough oxygen, if that cell is pre-treated and has a lot of intracellular oxygen in it, that might have a positive effect on resolution of the post-concussion symptoms much faster, an area of research, potential investigation. When you have this abnormal energy crisis, the hyperglycolysis, the cell goes into energy, uh, an energy crisis, it can activate proteases and end up actually going into the nucleus, programming that cell into apoptosis, a premature cell death, or just a necrotic cycle where the cell just ends up dying. Okay? So this is what's happening on a molecular level in the cell, briefly. Um, I basically talked about this already. Calcium magnesium concentration, uh, magnesium cofactor and glycolysis. Okay, it's, I'm going to just kind of skip through this. The other way uh, the, the brain can get damaged is axonal. So, so axons are, are the communicating fibers, so to speak, the nerve strands between different areas of the brain. You know, as I'm standing here right now, I'm using my sense of proprioception in my feet, I'm using my eyes, and I'm using my inner ear to balance myself. Well, my, mo my sensory strip is across the, my cortex, my vision is being processed in my occipital lobe in the back of my head, and my since it, my vestibular system is being processed in my inner ear. And I need those axonal connections between these different parts of the brain, as illustrated in this diffusion tensor imaging, in order to balance, in order to integrate those three processes to keep this balance. I mean, it's amazing what we're doing, right? I mean, I'm six foot three, and I'm standing on this little 12-inch platform over here, and I'm moving around, and I'm not falling because I'm integrating this material. Now let's look at these axonal injury, axonal, and how the axon can be injured, okay? Even for the non-scientists here, you've heard of gray matter and white matter, right? The brain. So the white matter is the axons. The gray matter are the neuron cell bodies, okay? So if I took a ping pong ball, and I took a golf ball, and I threw them up against the wall, are they going to bounce back the same? No. No. Now look at the brain. Gray matter, white matter, okay? Now we're, we're exposing it to a concussive blow from a blast, to a blow to the head, from a uh, crash, whatever. Boom! It hits the brain. Does it bounce back like this? Like this. Why? Because the gray matter and the white matter have di different densities. So instead of the brain uniformly rebounding off of the concussion from the skull, you get stretching, tear, tear, tearing, shearing of the axons, and now you have a disruption of the communication between different areas of the brain, so the brain's not communicating with itself very well, and as a result, you get a bunch of symptoms. <laughs> so the presence of post-concussive symptoms reflect injury to the brain, alteration of the neural metabolism, up or down regulation of neurochemical transmission, and changes in the neural pathways, the axonal damage. And this is where there's a possibility of intervention. I see a you know, great possibility of intervention of using oxygenated water, high oxygen, concentrations to sort of mitigate some of these symptoms. Now, uh, recovery from concussion, you know, it's a standard protocol here. We are very interested in high dose omega-3s uh, as as, as, as to help 
And I'm going to kind of skip through some of these because uh, I was asked to keep my talk a little bit shorter to stay in line over here. But we're not going to fix concussion today, but I just wanted to expose some of the, some of the me metabolic processes in concussion. But let's look at persistent post-concussion symptoms, okay? So but, uh, in, in a concussion, a single concussion injury, we expect it to resolve. Okay, if, it's, if, it's, if that concussion occurred during trauma, it's likely that the, the symptoms are going to last longer. If you have a bunch of concussions, the symptoms last longer. If you have concussions close together, really bad for concussions lasting longer. Okay, so what, what we want to do, and, and the thing is, you know, it's also really important to remember the brain is not like a, like a femur. Okay? The brain is the most sophisticated, most sophisticated and amazing machine in the entire universe. There's nothing more complicated than the human brain, and every concussion is different. You know, whether you get a concussion playing football, get blown up, get hit over the head in a, in a, you know, in a fight or whatever, concussions are all different. There's no standard protocol. Everybody's going to get, you know, like you fracture your femur, you know, or the orthopods are going to know approximately how long it's going to take for that to get repaired. Okay. You know, you have a cut, oh, it'll take a couple days and it'll heal. But with, with the brain, all bets are off with that predictability because it's the most complicated machine and how it can be injured in terms of the, the, bo both the size of the neurometabolic injury, what axons are damaged depending on how the brain hits. If the brain rotates real heavily, the vector of force is concentrated towards the center of the brain, the hippocampal areas and memory function gets altered by that. So it, the, the nature of the injury can take on you know, millions of different ma manifestations depending on that individual and how they were, their brain was injured during that concussion. But let's look at a military population, who I work with, okay, and a patient presents with post-concussive symptoms years after their concussion. Are the symptoms generated by the concussions or by something else? Most of the time, post-concussion symptoms, this is, this is in the civilian population, resolve in this time period. But why do post-concussive symptoms persist in some patients long after they're expected to recover? And there's no real, there's no real literature that's been developed on the pathophysiology of the persistence of post-concussion symptoms. But what we've introduced is this idea of post-traumatic stress in some way propagating, maintaining those post-concussion symptoms. Even though we've expected the concussion to, to heal, the symptoms are still there. So let's look at how can we fix this, what, get to the core of what's going on with this, okay? This is a great quote over here from this guy. I, I would never, I've never attempted to pronounce his name. I wish I could, but <laughs> it's one of those. San Georgi. Yeah, Georgi. what's that? San Georgi. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hungarian American scientist, you know, <laughs> who developed the Nobel Prize, but he made this a great sentence over here. Discovery consists of seeing what everybody has seen, but thinking what nobody has thought. It's kind of what we're doing here all day, right? We're looking at another way. <laughs> All right, I see a conspiracy going on here. <laughs> All right, so let, how is stress created? Let, 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 let's look at this word called stress, okay? Stress. How is stress created? By trauma, okay? I'm talking about a military population, but everybody in here experiences stress, okay? And that, that's why I'm going to ask you to sort of relate to what happens in here. We're going to talk about stress. We're going to talk about trauma, okay? But, you know, it's a big difference from being stressed out by, you know, life and death situations in combat. But stress, even, you know, how am I going to pay my bills? Am I going to get into this grad graduate school program? Will this residency accept me? You know, will I pass the U USMLE boards? Whatever it is. You know, all these scenarios can develop into stress, which can cause these physical symptoms. So on some level, I'm going to ask you all to kind of engage in this and understand that stress has a negative impact on our performance, both behaviorally and physically. Okay? So... What, what I do in explaining this to soldiers so they understand, do you want one of the big things in, in the military is like, how you doing? I'm okay. How you doing? I'm good. You know, meanwhile, there, you know, all kinds of stuff's going on in their brain, but I'm good, I'm good. You know, men in particular, we're not very sensitive to how we feel. We're action oriented, you know? We don't really know how we feel most of the time, okay? And don't like to admit it. Particularly in, in tough situations like military, you know, and certain athletic performances. So what I do is I divide the brain. And I, this is a really simplification of any neuroscientist in the room. Please forgive me for oversimplifying the brain. But it makes a nice model for understanding what goes on, okay? And I divide the brain into two brains. The cortex, which I call the human
human brain. This is my functional way of expressing what the cortex does. And the subcortex, which I'm calling the animal brain. Once again, another kind of functional description. So the cortex of our brain is where our memory, our reasoning powers, our language, personality, our consciousness is being processed. This is what allows us to be human beings. We're the most intelligent animal on Earth because we have the largest cortex. And as a result, we can reason things out. We have a memory. I mean, it's amazing. We've got this machine, right, that can move around, keep me balanced and move around, and yet I, and I can t sit here and talk about the machine. <laughs> it's amazing. Amazing. Okay? And that human brain thinks and takes actions. You know, when we woke up this morning, you know, we looked in our closet or in our suitcase and said, oh, I'm going to wear my black suit. I, got, I brought this tie from the United States to wear. I chose my outfit. At lunchtime, I chose what I ate. I used my memory, my reasoning powers to decide, this is what I'm going to eat to be healthy. I like the taste of this. I have a personality. I have preferences. Okay? Lions don't wake up and go, man, I'm sick of eating those damn zebras. I'm going to have an antelope for dinner tonight. <laughs> but we think. Okay? We think. We take actions. Okay? Now, the animal brain, the subcortex, okay, and I'm going to focus on a part called the amygdala. Uh, the animal brain doesn't think. Okay, the animal brain does not think. It reacts to incoming sensory information independent of the human brain. It triggers reactions. So at its basis, whether you're a cockroach, a Tyrannosaurus rex, a whale, or a human, we all utilize oxygen. We digest food. And then we have some system to move that oxygen and fuel around the body. So in the human, we have a circulatory system that, that, that uh, that moves around the products of digestion and our respiration, our breathing process. Okay? And think about it. We, don't, we can't control it. Because if I ask this audience, I say, OK, everybody stop your heart for three seconds. Could you do it? No. You can think it, though, right? You can think it, but you can't control it. You can't control what I'm calling the subcortical animal brain, the autonomic nervous system. If you had high blood pressure, about, hey, man, if blood pressure is going to kill you, you better slow that down. You can't control it. You could think it. But you can't control this animal brain, OK? You can't control the animal brain. You couldn't eat a sandwich now and you know, eat, to take your lunch. Oh, I'm going to digest half of this now, and I'm going I'm to digest the other half of dinner. Okay? You can't do it. You can think it, but you can't do it. Okay? Well, the animal brain is also programmed for instinctual behaviors that are present in all living things, eating, sexual reproduction. And we got this thing called the survival instinct, the most powerful instinctual behavior. Okay? You walk in your backyard, what do the birds and squirrels do when they see you? They take off. Why? Because they're looking at, oh, that guy looks mean. She looks really weird. I'm going to run away. No, they, they just react, okay? And we have that same instinct. We do not pump blood, digest food, or breathe better than a duck. We think better than a duck, okay? But we have the same animal instinct of survival, okay? Now, Through the millennium of human existence on this planet, I always love to look at evolutionary biology because it points out we're able to see how the, the brain, the human brain, kind of through natural selection became to be what it is today. And we're all, we all have a negative bias, you know, the psychologists in the audience, if there are any, know about this. It's a very simple thing to understand. Okay, when you're faced with a situation, you will see the bad stuff before you see the good stuff. Why? Because it's primed for danger. Okay, go back to the caveman days, you know, 300,000, we've been on the planet for 300,000 years, you know, we've only had laws, <clears throat> police forces for like 5,000 years, right, the Code of Hammurabi in Babylon is the oldest living, I mean, the oldest surviving rules, laws that we know of. So right, about 295,000 years, humans existed on this planet without any laws, any rules. So everything had to be suspicious. Everything had to be suspicious. So we developed, through natural selection, a negative bias. Those early, hom well, from the hominids from 3 million years ago to the humans, homo sapiens, 300,000 years ago, the more negative you saw a situation, the more likely you were to survive. And we tend to have a very negative bias towards things. Look, and, 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 and you might think, oh, he's crazy. We don't have that. No, look at the news today. What's on the news? Good stuff? No, bad stuff. Amplification of bad stuff. You know, I don't know how bad it is here in the UK and Hungary, but you know, in the United States, it's like blah, 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 this bad stuff, this bad stuff, murders, this, this. You know, he said this. 
said, she said this, you know, back and forth. Is, it the, new, is the news media really trying to present to us an a, a honest evaluation of the current uh, political climate, the current world, world climate, whatever? No, what are they doing? They're trying to raise ratings so they can sell their advertising for more money. So what do they do? They use this negative bias to suck people in to watch their TV show, their news, read their magazines or whatever, because we want to know about the bad stuff. Think of conversations in the next coming days that you have with somebody you might not see for a while. You say, how are you doing? I'm okay. Oh, yeah, but I have this going on. I have this stuff going on. My leg hurts. My, my uncle went to the hospital. You know, the negative stuff tends to come out all the time. We have this negative bias, okay? The amygdala is the part of the brain in the animal brain that's primed for danger. Negative events and experience get quickly stored in memory. Positive events and experience need to be held in awareness for a dozen or more seconds to actually transfer from short-term memory to the long-term storage in the prefrontal cortex, okay? Now you send a person to war with a negative bias, and that results in hyperactivation of this primitive survival instinct. The amygdala becomes fear conditioned. Unconsciously created stress develops as a survival mechanism. Now check this out. The animal brain is actually faster physiologically than the human brain, okay? The animal brain, what I'm calling the animal brain, the amygdala, is faster than the human brain. Sensory data comes in, and before we recognize what it is, our amygdala is making a decision. Is this dangerous? If it is, I'm going to trigger a release of adrenaline and put this person into fight or flight. Okay? It's non-thinking. Okay? This is really important when you're in a combat situation where some rotten bastards are trying to shoot you or kill you or blow you up on a daily basis. So what happens is soldiers get activated when there are boots on the ground in Iraq, Afghanistan, Vietnam, whatever. Okay? What happens is this survival instinct gets amplified, and it's the best thing that can happen to you when you're in a war zone. Because the faster you react to something, the more likely you are to survive. Okay? Now, you think about that soldier coming back from combat. What do they do? They, get down, they sit on an airplane for 10 hours with a belt on, sitting in a chair in the sky for 10 hours. No magical transformation. And then they walk off the plane, and they go, hey, I'm back in the United States. Well, that's the thinking human brain that's understanding geography. See a problem developing here? Human brain understands geography. But the animal brain, which became aroused, hyperactivation of negative bias, is now in a hyperaroused state, doesn't understand geography. And you can't change it any more than you can change your blood pressure. So when a warrior comes back from combat, this animal brain, which is reacting faster to situations than the thinking brain, is processing information and trumping any conscious individual personality trait or whatever to soldiers reacting, non-thinking. So a soldier could be walking down the street and all of a sudden, boom, some loud sound goes off and he jumps down, dives for cover. Before the human brain can figure out oh, that was some idiot slammed the car door, car backfiring, uh, you know, dump, uh, dumpsters being delivered or something at a construction site. So he's react, he or she is reacting to the situation from the amygdala, the non-thinking animal brain, before they can figure out what's actually going on. Make sense? Non-thinking response. We've all had, whether we've been in combat or not, all had a startle response. You know, I've got, I've got soldiers who don't like being at award ceremonies because the cannons blow. So they'll stand there, the cannons are coming. When they're anticipating, the cannons are coming, I'm not going to do anything. And then, boom, the cannon blows, and they jump. Why? Because at that instantaneous moment when that cannon goes off, before they can think, oh, there's the cannon just like I expected it, the animal brain's already triggered the release of adrenaline, putting them in fight mode. Okay. So now you have a soldier back in the United States, hyperactivated. That primitive survival instinct does not want him sleeping. Sleeping's dangerous, man. Somebody could go in and shoot you, kill you, burn your house down, kill your children, kill your spouse. Stay up, check the door, check the locks, keep a weapon next to the bed, get a big dog, get an alarm system. I'll say that to soldiers and they'll go, Doc, how do you know, man? You're in the house? <laughs> <laughs> That's why they're not sleeping. They're waking up nightmares. Let's talk about nightmares. Why do we have nightmares? What's the biological uh, uh, purpose of nightmares? To keep us hyper aroused, okay? It's a, it's a trait that through natural selection, proved to be advantageous for survival in the human species. Because when you have a nightmare about something bad, you remember it, and you're more alert, okay? 
It's proven to be, it's helped us survive on this planet for hundreds of thousands of years. Okay? Trauma affects the brain. It per keeps persistent effects, which change in behavior and, and cause these physical symptoms. I just talked about sleep. Let's move on to memory. Okay? So a soldier could be, uh, so I'll, I'll ask the soldier, so, so let's say your spouse says to you, hey, hey, baby, let's go out to dinner. Oh, I can't go, man. That restaurant's too crowded. Oh, come on. It's our anniversary. Let's go. Okay, I'll go. So, we're, so I'll say, so, so where do you sit in the restaurant? Right? Back to the wall. That whole restaurant's in front of him <laughs> or her. Okay? Their spouse is across from him. I said, so what are you doing? You, are you talking engaging with your spouse? No, man. I'm scanning the room. Okay? Hyper alertness. Hyper arousal. Everybody and everything is a threat. They learn in theater all strangers are dangerous. Okay, don't trust anybody in Iraq, Afghanistan. Okay, you come back home, who's in that restaurant? Strangers. In their intelligent human brain, yes, they know these are strangers, American citizens or English citizens, <laughs> having, having dinner. But be, the animal brain is processing all that in sensory information coming in, putting them to the state of hyper arousal, and they're sitting there with their spouse not hearing a word of the conversation. The next day, their spouse says to you, hey, honey, you ready to go? go where are we going? Don't you remember yesterday during the, during the conversation you said you were going to come with me today? Oh, I don't remember that. And then the spouse says, what's the matter, baby? How come you don't listen to me? I tell the soldier, I said, you know, you just got to tell your spouse, listen, maybe I don't remember that, but when we were in that restaurant, nobody put a bullet in your head or a dagger in your back because I had you covered. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what's happening. It's not that they're ignoring it. Their, their intelligent cortical brain wants to engage but that primitive survival instinct that's activating faster than their conscious brain is hijacking their attention. So it's not a memory problem all the time. It is a concentration attention problem. Now, in some soldiers who have had multiple concussions, okay, we can do something called neuropsychological testing. And sometimes after maybe a few concussions, maybe a boatload of concussions, they will have actual brain damage, which we can diagnose on neuropsychological testing. Okay, so. There's a bunch of variations and possibilities in here. But it, this is a, a really important thing to weed out as we're talking to soldiers. They're not, they're also memory is significantly affected by lack of sleep, okay? Uh, when, when a soldier is really stressed out, or an individual stressed out, when, you, you know, when you've been stressed out over exams, finances, relationships, whatever, what happens? Muscles tighten up, right? <laughs> And what, what happens when the muscles here in the, in the traps and the neck tighten up? They can generate headaches. So one of the things that's really, really important to, to sort of figure out in the beginning is, are they having headaches, even migraines, generated by muscle tension, <coughs> which can be easily treated. We send them to our occupational therapist. She has a great protocol for stretching myofascial release and trigger point release, and headaches get better. And then there's the, then there's the, the irritability, okay? Irritability. So remember, the animal brain is operating faster than the thinking brain. So when, when information comes in, it can be processed before the individual recognizes absolutely what's going on. So we had this one, <coughs> one couple at Fort Gordon. The, the soldier was a man. His wife was, they were home together. And the wife asked her husband, hey, honey, can you take out the garbage room today? Sure, baby, no problem. So he took out the trash, did a great job. Now, while he was cleaning out the garbage, he walked into the living room, and he, he uh, I'm sorry, while he was taking out the garbage, she walked in, his wife walked into the living room, and discovered that their two little children had spilled chocolate milk all over this white sofa. And there's big, nasty stain on the sofa. How do you think she felt about that? Oh my God, the sofa's got stains on it. She was mad, why did I let these kids drink chocolate milk in here? Oh man, she's not happy. And she walks back to her husband, and she's pissed. She's angry, okay? And she says to him in a nasty tone of voice, did you take out that trash like I asked you? F you, I took out the trash. Who are you talking to? Whoa. How's he talking, man? But let's look at the video. How did she approach him? Hostile, aggressive, threatening. In order for him to recognize that's my wife, he needs his memory for wife in his human brain. It hasn't kicked in yet. In order for him to recognize, did you take out the garbage, he needs his memory for English language words. It hasn't kicked in yet. So he never looked at his wife and said, here is the woman I love. I married her. She's coming at me aggressively. I am now going to curse at her. <laughs> there was no decision involved, okay? 
We've all had arguments like this where we've said things to loved ones that we didn't really mean because something in our mechanism got triggered by a comment, an action. And so we, non-thinking, react to things before we can actually comprehend them. And afterward, you know, and of course the wife didn't like when she was, the, the guy cursed at her, so she goes, what'd you say to me? And he cursed at her, she goes, yeah, yeah, she gave it right back to him. And now they're in this big argument over nonsense, because they loved each other. Hey, I love you, baby, let's get married and live happily ever after. But in the heat of that moment, it's these two instincts clawing for survival. Okay? Is that crazy? No, man, that's post-traumatic stress. Okay? Having a significant impact on, on the performance. So we just talked about Sleep, memory, headaches, mood, how it's propagated in some percentage, you know, maybe it's 100%, maybe it's 10%, whatever, that it's maybe, and there's brain injury that's all intertwined in there. But what's, what, what's the solution for this? And some of this stuff, you know, there's a criteria. I don't believe in PTSD either, but there is criteria for it. Sometimes it doesn't make, make, matter if it meets that or not. This is the important stuff to recognize because this is a normal reaction. It reflects physiological changes in neurochemistry, some, some people are more likely pre, predisposed to this, okay, uh, affected by stress. When, when a soldier's going out to battle, okay, and he's getting, you know, hopping in his Humvee, you know, his, his, the, the neurochemical milieu of stress hormones in his blood, how does that affect the concussion? Hyperthermia is another thing to look at. You're, you're doing a mission outside in Iraq at 130 degrees, you know. That elevated temperature can have a significant impact on how the brain injury will actually impact the metabolism of the, the, the neurometabolism after the injury. Once adrenaline gets released in that reaction, the sympathetic nervous system is activated and cannot easily be shut down by the rational thinking cortical brain because the adrenaline is a, is a powerful hormone that prepares us to fight. Okay? The non thinking activation is critical for survival and combat, but don't work so well when we come home. This is all, you know, occurring through the hyperarousal and the amygdala, the hypothalamic pituitary axis. I'm going to skip some of this stuff because I know I'm talking a lot. Um, mood and pain are intricately related. You know, if you look at if you look at a person's mood, so pain would be another factor involved. In this. like like in, in depression, do depressed people have more or less pain? More pain, right? That hyper alertness of the of the of the the hyperactivity in the limbic system, the paralimbic structures, and it ends up amplifying pain. So if we can quiet down this whole system, pain, chronic pain issues will also get better. Mood and pain are intimately related. One of our fellow physicians a couple of years ago, it's more important to know what sort of person has a disease than to know what sort of disease a person has. One of my colleagues, Gary Goldberg at the uh, Tampa, uh, not Tampa, the Richmond, uh, Virginia VA in the United States put these slides up at a, at a conference, and I, I'm using them from him. Uh, and I want to give him credit for this. Because patients experience illness as suffering, but physicians diagnose disease as pathology. Okay? In an idealized biomedical scientific paradigm, the subjective experience of the patient is reduced to the diagnostic process to an objective disease me mechanism. Ideally, it's it leads to a choice of effective treatment to address the underlying disease to relieve suffering. And this works sometimes in infectious diseases. But as the general said, you can't subjectively, you, 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 you know, it, post it like in, in, in the, this is a gross oversimplification, satisfying when it works, but in the presence of history of trauma and or significant stress, there may be no such successful reduction of patient experience of physical organic disease. So just because a person comes in and said, you know, oh, I'm feeling depressed and anxious and I can't go out to crowded public places, do you give them a pill? No. <coughs> and then they come back and say, that didn't work. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> no kidding. Because they're not psychiatrically agoraphobic. They've got, the reason they're up, um, uncomfortable in crowded public places is because their arousal level is so suspicious. So a anti anxiety medication is not going to work, then you give them another one, you give them another one. So this system does not work for, in the presence of severe trauma, okay? It's current symptomatology does not necessarily mean that the current symptoms can be etiologically linked to a possible prior injury. Experience is a patient reality, and that's what we need to see, each patient individual. What is going on with this person? And a symptom is more than just a manifestation of the physical pathology. 
So the goals of treatment for these persistent post-concussion symptoms is normalization of neural networks, stabilize the neuroendocrine and immune function, and optimize neurotrophic support of neurons. I think there's a place for cocoon in here? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, let's look at global versus focal interventions. You know, when you take a pill, what does it do? It goes into your gut, it gets absorbed into your blood, your blood takes it from head to toe, hits every cell in your body, right? We don't have a sniper a bullet of, of a medication to hit the amygdala and tone down hyper, you know, hyper stress, okay? But we can do things to quiet down the brain using focal strategies, okay? So this is the goal. What can we do to affect specific neural pathways in the brain? Well, exercise. Exercise doesn't have side effects, right? No sexual side effects from exercise. Meditation, okay? I was so, it was so cool to hear uh, Dr. Sam here start out with meditation, okay? It's a, one of the big strategies that we use. Yoga, biofeedback, prayer, spiritual practices. The chaplain plays a very important part in our program. Okay. Uh, Therapy-based interventions, you know, physical therapy, occupational therapy, cognitive therapy, recreational. So these are different techniques in mind-body medicine, deep breathing, muscle stretching, physical exercise, progressive muscle, yoga, guided imagery, meditation, spiritual practices, mindful health eating, biofeedback. Okay. So talk about exercise, reduces stress, normalizes sleep, enhances self-confidence, generates BDNF and endorphins. Okay, endorphins, you know, we've all heard about this. The athletes here in the room know the endorphins well. Okay, it triggers positive feeling. It's a natural pain reducer. Okay. Uh, BDNF. When BDNF is absent, it's difficult to normalize the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Stress and pain decrease BDNF. Okay. How do, oops. How do we increase it? Through exercise. Okay. Meditation. Let me talk about meditation training. So, we have a program, a three-week program at, at our hospital to, where we go through these details with soldiers in excruciating detail, and they learn meditation. If they decide to pursue meditation, we teach them a very specific mantra-based uh, practice called transcendental meditation. And we publish some stuff on this. There's a lot of papers on this. We initially published, uh, uh, there were four case studies here. And then a couple of years later, we, we did an analysis in 74 service members with documented <laughs> post-traumatic stress. Uh, um, or anxiety disorder diagnoses, 37 that practiced TM and 37 that did not, the TM group was less likely to increase medication dosages and more likely to show medication stabilization decreases or cessations under very close clinical controls. This is a slide hot off, hot, hot off the press, printed in Lancet Psychiatry last month, an English journal, right? That showed comparison of TM prolonged exposure and health education controls on percentage of vets showing clinically significant improvements in PTSD and depression. Blue, percentage of patients showing clinically significant improvements. Blue is TM. Okay. The standard of treatment for uh, uh, trauma is prolonged exposure and health education. So meditation is proving to be a very, very valuable source of, of recovery. Mood and food, okay, that was mentioned several times today, the diet, critically important. Okay. Particularly uh, the omega-3 concentrations to me. This was actually in, a, in a, uh, is it the, uh, is this the one? Yeah, anyways, lot, 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 lots of great information on omega-3. There, there was an entire, entire journal, uh, entire supplement of the journal Military Medicine in 2014 that looked at the use of omega-3 fatty acids to enhance stress resilience, wellness, and military performance. A whole bunch of articles, five or six articles, and there was a, a, a subject matter expert panel that decided, the panel concluded that based on studies analyzing omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acid balance, it would be unethical to not attempt of elevating, elevating the omega-3 status among U.S. military personnel. Okay, omega-3 fatty acids have gone about 4,000% in the, in the civilian community in the last few years, and they're pro-inflammatories. So this is one way to kind of cut that down. Vitamin D is another thing we use. I'm running out of time here, so we just get, 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 get to the end. So, you know, we, we talk about food, it's a typical model, and this, this is all information about our particular cycle, uh, three-week cycle of stuff that we use. And uh, so what I want to say in closing is both TBI and post-traumatic stress are physiological injuries which need to be treated within the larger context of symptoms, including insomnia, pain, mood, 
headaches, etc. We avoid the perspective of post-traumatic stress as a psychological <laughs> injury versus TBI as a physical injury. They're both changes in neurometabolic physical things. And effective treatment really demands a holistic approach, looking at the entire body, not only treating one symptom with those, the dreaded pharma pharmaceutical stuff. The most effective treatment is multidisciplinary and multimodal. Great. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, John. So, Curtis Capital. Okay.